of some research from the Woodrow Wilson Institute Foundation. Foundation. And it was about uh, awareness and, uh, of history and their letter grades for states and everything. And so I reached out to the prolific person from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation on Twitter and got an immediate response. And we talked, and he is here with us today to present. Wow. Thank you. I appreciate you and you all inviting me here today. Um, this is exciting, but I also realize it's dangerous when I'm, I'm one of the people standing between you all and dinner. Um, so it's never a good thing. Um, so I, I sort of feel like I am home. I, I grew up in an American history household. Uh, my father, while he was a college president by profession, was an American uh, presidency scholar by trade. Uh, I remember as an elementary school student sitting around the dinner table as we were trying to come up with the title for his latest book uh, and settling on a quote. Um, it, it was uh, a republic, if you can keep it. This is a, the foundations of the American presidency, and that was the one that stuck. Uh, you know, I grew up not far from here when my father was dean of UMass Boston, uh, and I thought it was completely normal to be an elementary school student and not only visit presidential libraries, which my father had helped build, um, but actually know the curators because you were there that often. <laughs> and so it, it became a shock to me that with all of that and my interest in history continued and continued and because of my father, when I was in ninth grade, I applied for an NEH fellowship one summer because I wanted to study and I didn't realize that, yeah, they really weren't giving those to ninth graders. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and, and even going to, I, I went to the University of Virginia, an institution with its own history, uh, rich in history, both from its founder onward. And so American history was always something that I, I just greatly appreciated. I went on, I worked on, on Capitol Hill, I worked for a boss, a US senator who was known for being the historian of the US Senate. And I assumed that a passion for history, an interest in history, a knowledge of history was something that everybody had. Um, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> So the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, just but for way of background for those who aren't familiar with it, we actually have nothing to do with Woodrow Wilson. We have nothing to do with Princeton University and the Woodrow Wilson School there, even though we are also based in Princeton. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation was created in 1945, where this country had made a promise to GIs returning from the war that they could have a college education and the recognition that we didn't have nearly enough college professors to meet that obligation. And so the foundation was created to begin to identify, recruit, and prepare individuals who otherwise never would have gotten a PhD in a whole host of humanities subjects, never would have gotten a PhD and help them do so so they could become college professors. And then over the years, over the last 74 years to be precise, what we've done is continued our mission in how do we help prepare the leaders of tomorrow for the great challenges we face. And about a dozen years ago, we realized that one of the greatest challenges that we could help this country prepare for was how do we make sure the kids are learning? So we focus on how do we prepare K-12 teachers? We focus how do we make sure that schools, particularly high need schools, have excellent teachers? How do we make sure that those same schools have excellent principals? Uh, we've been working for the last four years in partnership with MIP, MIT to build a new type of graduate school of education, one that looks at the mastery, understanding, not on time served, but we've always been true to our roots in terms of the humanities. And so about four years ago, thanks to the generosity of one of our board members, uh, we decided that one of the things we could really do that could have an impact with the work we were doing with MIT, we saw that you know, the way the kids today were learning was very different than the way I had learned, was very different probably than the way many of you learned. And so we decided what we wanted to do is we wanted to start working with social studies teachers and see what could we do to make history a little more interesting, to make history come alive in their classrooms. Not saying that they weren't good teachers, but how can we better equip them? And so we spent the last four years working with teachers up and down the East Coast in teaching them game theory. And the thought here wasn't that we were teaching them how to design the next Fortnite or, or even teach them to code at all. It was working with just exemplary social studies teachers and helping them understand how they could develop board games, how they could develop card games. We have a wonderful one from a, a town not too far from here, an escape room based on American Revolution, um, and how they could really just make it more interesting. And it got us thinking, this was something that we could really do. We could really have an impact true to our roots. How can we improve the way American history is not just taught, but it's learned? 
How can we make it more relevant, more interesting for today's high school students? Because I think everybody knows, you see the statistics again and again, we're seeing that more and more universities are now no longer requiring history as a requirement for graduation. And if they are requiring history, they're not requiring American history. Uh, we see in state after state a call for more, uh, more understanding of civics education. We're seeing in terms of higher ed, while we have the highest number of individuals now going to college ever in the nation's history, the percentage of college goers who are actually majoring in history percentage-wise is the lowest it has ever been since we've been tracking that. So the question for us became, why is this a problem? What is it about American history that those who went to school during World War II have an appreciation for it, understand it, appreciate it, know it, just really want to better understand it, but you're not seeing it with today's kids. And so as we were getting ready to build our initiative, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, we decided what we had to really do is test whether the theory is correct. And we've been hearing now, you can go back decades and decades, you can go back more than 50 years and see in the media a chronicling of the fact that Americans simply don't know American history. We know that. Um, but we've never quite tested it. We've always made the assumption. It's not like reading. It's not like math in school. We don't actually measure it in a lot of states. Um, it's not something that we tend to really do. The closest we come is every year the Annenberg Center will do a, a survey on what we know about civics. And they'll ask basic questions, how many Supreme Court justices are there, those sorts of things. Uh, and we see that Americans don't know civics, and how do we expect them to be educated, knowledgeable, passionate voters if they don't understand their civics? So we wanted to get at the question, what do we know about American history? And the first problem we came with is, how do you actually measure that? Um, you know, we don't want to make the teaching of American history the equivalent of what is it I need to know in order to pass a bar night per trivia contest one day. That doesn't get to the point, but you have to start somewhere. And so, you know, we wanted to look at adults. If you look at, at K-12 today, 39 states require their students to take American history in high school. Only 39. Um, most of them are taking it in 10th or 11th grade. Um, in many of those states, they do have exams that they have to pass. New York State has the Regents exam. Massachusetts is just putting one in place now. You see states like that. But it's, it's a complicated process to measure it. And so when you look at something like determining whether we actually know our history, um, the questions can become just as controversial as the answers, particularly in today's day and age with the heat that we have on just about everything in every corner of society. And so we wanted to really figure out, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation wanted to figure out, if we're going to measure this, how do we do it? How do we do it in a way that's effective, that people are not going to attack it out of the gate? in terms of bias with the questions or even bias with the answers. Um, if we had created the questions ourselves, we would have faced criticisms, uh, regardless of what questions and answers we provided. And so what we determined, there was really only one exam that we could use that even began to look at what was possible. And that becomes the US citizenship test. Um, for those of you that are not aware, if you want to become a US citizen, you have to pass a test. You're asked 10 questions. You're not given any multiple choice answers. Ten open questions that you are asked verbally and you have to verbally provide an answer. In order to become a US citizen, you have to get six of those ten questions correct. When those who are seeking citizenship take this test, about 90% of them pass it on the first try. And what they have in order to prepare for this is the federal government is kind, thanks to all of you for your tax dollars, where they provide a battery of practice tests, um, questions and answers, multiple choice questions and answers that are available online, that are updated every year, that one can use uh, to begin to prepare for this test. And so we figured, you know what makes perfect sense? We're going to use this. And what we'll do is we will, we will focus on those questions that are American history related, not those that are necessarily civics, um, and ask 20 questions using the same questions and the same answers that are provided by the federal government to help those pass the test. So, last fall we decided, you know, we're gonna, before we really do this at large, we're gonna do a, we're gonna run a sample. We're gonna do a quick national survey, thousand people across the country, representative sample, see how they do. And the results weren't good. Um, 
what we found was on average 40% of Americans could pass the test. 40% could get at least 12 of 20 questions correct when given multiple choices to pick from. 40%. 40% passed. You needed a 60% to pass it. So they had to get 12 questions correct. So then we decided, you know what we're going to do? is we're going to take these exact same questions and we're going to do this in a much larger way because we needed to understand where the shortcomings may have been. Um, you know, the 1,000-person sample is nice, but we really wanted to understand if we look state by state, we can look at those states that don't have an American history requirement in high school. You can look at those states that don't have history as part of an exit requirement. You can look at all sorts of things. And so we ended up, at the end of last year, we surveyed 41,000 Americans. Um, that way we had a representative sample, scientifically based sample in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia that let us look. And we, just, we asked the exact same questions we had asked last fall. And on a national result, we were shocked because we got the exact same response. 41,000 took it, 40% could pass it. Um, and then when you got into a state-by-state -state breakdown, we, we were hoping to see a little better. We found only one state, the state of Vermont, had at least half of the people in their survey were able to pass it. In Vermont, 53% were able to pass. Um, the state that came in 51st, 27% of their people were able to pass and that is the great state of Louisiana. What you also saw, though, was you saw it was incredibly disturbing is when you looked at the breakdowns by age. And what we saw is that for those over 65, they did particularly well, which is wonderful. It's what you'd hope to see. For those in my demographic, that you were seeing those that were between the ages of 45 and 65, not so well. Not putrid, but not so well. For those under the age of 45, 20% could pass it. Those who were closest to having taken American history, one in five, could get 12 out of 20 questions correct. These were not incredibly challenging questions. Uh, at least for those, I'm sure everybody here would get 100%. Part of what we saw on social media, on Twitter, was people we, we've made available on our own website. One can go and take the 20-question survey, see how you would do. Um, we've had now more than 325,000 people have logged on to take it. And others have been sharing it all over the internet to let them know that their education obviously better prepared them than other people's education. Um, but the questions were not incredibly difficult. Um, you know, there were some quibbles in terms of the language that some of the questions offered. Um, one in particular about the cause of the American Revolution, uh, where whoever wrote the question for the citizenship test was trying to get at the fact that it was because uh, you were having British soldiers quartered in American homes. Um, they made reference to economic, one of, one of the other answers, one of the incorrect answers was one of economic crisis, which some people have said, well, the taxes were a type of economic crisis. I'm not going to dispute that. That's the way the federal government had decided to run the test. Some of them were far more basic. Um, you know, we should not have a third of Americans think that the greatest achievement of Benjamin Franklin was the fact that he invented the light bulb. <laughs> we should not have half of Americans being unable to determine who our three major opponents were during World War II when given a multiple choice list. We should not have more than 25% of Americans that thought Dwight Eisenhower was a general during the Civil War. But we do. Um, and so as, as we were going through this, as I said, you know, the results become startling. You see the age breakdowns. Um, you see the breakdowns by gender. You see the breakdowns by race. And, and nothing there is surprising. Um, it's disappointing. And it became important to us to really understand, because the, the intent of this was not to embarrass. The intent of doing the survey was not to say, we're really stupid when it comes to American history. Uh, as I said, this has been a fact that we've known. We might not have quantified it, 
But we've known this for decades and decades. We've known this for generations and generations. Um, we just haven't necessarily quantified it this way. And you know, I've spent some time working with legislatures over the last few months, and, and for those of you who are unaware, uh, you have a significant number of legislatures, particularly those in red states that have decided that the greatest thing that we can do right now is we need to increase civics requirements in our schools today. Um, and there are at least three states that in fact are going to require that we actually have to pass the citizenship test in order to get a high school diploma. Um, and I will set aside whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but that's the action that they're taking. But I think as part of this, as we've gone through it, we've been looking at how we teach American history. Because one can look at this, and we saw a number of media pieces that have written this, that clearly Americans just don't know their history. But any of you in this room know that's not the case. Most Americans take U.S. history. In fact, most of us take it at least two years during our K-12, once in middle school, once in high school. 39 states actually test it. So we know that for thir in 39 states, students had to pass an American history test in order to get their high school diploma already. What we're able to find, though, is we're finding that once they're adults, they've forgotten it. So why is it that they're forgetting it? We know, we know that they're learning it, at least it's being taught to them. Um, the immediate response that we got from some folks, well, the problem is it's who's teaching it. We have really bad history teachers in this country. They're all coaches who just need a place to sit during the day. <laughs> of course, that's not true. Uh, when you really dig into the certification process and you look at those who have secondary social studies certifications, you find that those who are teaching American history are some of our most qualified, strongest teachers that we have in public K-12 today. So the question really is begs now is, is what is then the problem? If you have good teachers who are teaching it, you have students that are eventually, that are learning it in order to get their high school diploma. Why is it that they're forgetting it? And why is it that they're not studying it once they get to college? And so what we looked at this, again, reflecting on the work that we've done in other programs at Woodrow Wilson, is the problem is that the way that we're teaching American history today is it's not interesting. It's not relevant for the average student. They don't see the purpose. They're not seeing themselves. They're not seeing their life plans. They're not seeing their futures. They're not seeing their communities in the way that we teach American history. And so as we've been looking at it, you know, how do you then begin to address this? And it really becomes, you know, how do you layer on that, that type of experiential learning that kids are going to start seeing something, they see the value of it. And I think, you know, when, when we started out, we actually thought, you know, the, the way you do this is you simply, if you create a game, you're going to get kids interested. Yeah, not quite. We started talking with social studies teachers. What is the one thing, if you were provided, what could you use in the classroom that's really going to help you improve the teaching and learning of social studies today? It's going to make it more interesting for all the kids in your class. And I don't know how, ma how many of you are familiar with the, the online feature, Drunken History. All right. Good. Almost every single teacher that we've talked to from teachers across the country said, if you can give us drunken history, you take out the bad language and you take out the alcohol, that's all we need to make history more interesting. <laughs> Great. And so then we started talking to students. We're like, what is it that you, what, that you really need? And every student, it was all a different perspective. You had some that you know, would love to have games. You had some that would love to have better videos. Not videos where I have to listen to some old professor lecturing me, but something that's actually interesting. You had students that, you know, what I really want is a graphic novel. I want this, I want that. Everybody's got a different perspective. And so where we've begun to really focus on is looking at this in such a way that how do you begin to knit all this together? How do you begin to provide a learning platform for students outside of the school day that they can use to actually begin to find history fun? That they can start digging down into the parts that are really important to them, not the parts that are important to the test or important to the teacher that's in their classroom. And so that's what we're doing now, is really trying to figure this out in a way that's going to make sense. It's going to reflect what we're hearing from students. It's going to reflect what we're hearing from teachers. It's going to reflect what we're hearing from professors and recognizing that you have a lot of good work that's going on across the country that's already doing this. How do you begin to pull that together so that people can find it all in one place? You know, how do you recognize that not everybody is passionate about American history? And so you know, if you look at this in terms of you know, how do you address the different pieces, 
you know, all of you who are here today, you're serious about American history. This is a passion. Otherwise, you wouldn't be spending your Saturday here. You'd be out with folks celebrating St. Patrick's Day today. Well, we're going to do that, too. Absolutely. But <laughs> having come in earlier today, there's a lot of people who have a jump on you. I've got to tell you. I know how to catch on. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> so as, as we're really getting it, you know, for those people, there are deep dives into history. There's something where you're really going to dig in. You're doing the research. You want to find out more about a topic that you care about. And those deep dives become very important. But there's only a very select group of students today that want to do that sort of deep dive. And so then how do you start engaging them in history in a way that they, they're going to begin to start off by being distracted? And so by distraction, I mean, how do you start creating BuzzFeed quizzes? That sort of style of thing. It's going to take just a couple minutes where people are going to get interested. They're going to look at this. Um, it's going to reflect who they are. And they, well, it becomes important reflecting who they are because you can't have a BuzzFeed quiz that says, who were you during the Civil War? And every single African-American student is Frederick Douglass. It doesn't work that way. It needs to really be something that, that is of value. And then how do you begin to dabble? You know, anybody who has middle school or high school students today knows that their kids probably spend a whole lot of time on YouTube. That's dabbling. How do you provide that sort of content where people can just go in and experience it for a short term. And so, as, as we were getting around this, I mean, I mean, I'm sure probably everybody in this room has at least listened to the Hamilton soundtrack. So this becomes part of this distract, dabble, and dive. Is, you know, we've had this public belief, shall we say, that because of Lin-Manuel Miranda, everybody understands everything about Alexander Hamilton in that period of history. Um, as somebody who attended Mr. Jefferson's university, I will say he got our founder a little bit wrong. Um, but everybody appreciates it. And you know, there's no question that you can find lots of, even my own kids, who can sing along and they know the words to the songs and they want to see the show. So one of the questions that we put, though, because you know, this, this becomes the perfect example, is how do you use, say, pop culture? How do you use rap in order to make American history more interesting? Um, and so one of the things that we did was we put a question from the citizenship test. We were curious. Uh, which of the following individuals did not write the Federalist Papers? Uh, the correct answer, obviously, was Thomas Jefferson. And anybody who has listened to the soundtrack or seen the show would know that Jefferson and Hamilton never did a single thing together. Um, and it would seem a pretty easy answer. As expected, the vast majority of Americans got it wrong. Um, they thought that the pen name was actually a made-up name that nobody would actually write under the name Publius. Uh, and that was what they got. Some people picked Alexander Hamilton. A number of people picked James Madison. A lot of people got it wrong. And so, you know, it, it became that question, how do you make sure, though, that what you're taking in terms of making experiential learning, how do you really apply it? Um, simply having the song was not enough to have, the, have people get that question correct. And so it becomes interesting for those uh, who have been fortunate enough to see the show. Um, Gilder Lehrman Institute in New York has probably the greatest library of revolutionary period documents available on the planet. And they have also gone into partnership with the folks that produced Hamilton, the musical. And they decided they had captured, there's lightning in a bottle when you see the student's interest in Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and for most of those students, particularly starting in New York City, those students are unable to actually afford to go see the show. And so they decided to create an educational program for Hamilton. And so the test for this was, you know, it would be very easy to simply say, okay, once every month, they're going to do a matinee, they're going to bring poor students from across the city or across the country to see the show, and they will say that they have done their job. Um, most, thing, most of what we know with regard to cognitive learning is that's about as ineffective as it comes. Uh, it is a rare moment in time that kids are not going to hold on to. So in order to get the invitation, to get the ticket to see Hamilton as part of Edu Hamilton, students have to create their own content. They have to use the Gilder Lehrman website, look at original content, look at third-party content, create their own songs create their own poems, create their own video, something that captures a moment in history that is not currently in the Hamilton soundtrack, but is obviously based on that style. And what you see is you see an absolutely incredible collection of content created by students across the country. 
uh, who have really dug into pieces that they otherwise never would have studied. Um, I saw a couple weeks ago, I saw a young woman in New York City who had an original song that she wrote based on Abigail Adams. Uh, obviously somebody who Bostonians would know well, most people don't. Um, you see all sorts of things that have come out of that. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about in terms of experiential learning, is how can we really make this relevant? Um, and this becomes, I think, the great challenge. Again, you know, we're looking at this, as the, the point here for us is not, as I said, how do you pass a trivia contest? How do you do well? How do you answer those quick questions you're trying to prove you're smarter than the person sitting next to you? Um, our goal here, as a foundation, but I think as a country, is how do you start getting all young people to begin to think like historians? And by that, I don't mean that they're all going to become churnows and write really thick books about American historical figures that most people hadn't heard of before. Um, instead, it's really getting at the same things we've been talking about with our kids for decades now, is how do you start getting them to be critical thinkers? How do you start get, getting them to ask questions, to dig deeper, um, to sometimes question and push back and explore things beyond what they're basically taught? Think, you know, those are all the characteristics of a really strong historian. Those are the reasons why you all are here today. Uh, and those are the sorts of things as we're looking at how one teaches American history um, that we can really begin to figure out how you can get kids to start seeing that, how you can start getting them to appreciate it. And I think as we look at this, you know, are we going to change dramatically how well Americans do if they're asked these questions off the citizenship exam? I don't know. Um, it's been a fascinating exercise. As I said, we've had more than 325,000 people have taken our survey. Um, and we've had a great number of individuals who have called in because they have significant problem with both the questions and the multiple choice answers that were provided. <laughs> Um, and somehow telling them that this is the product of the federal government does not soothe their souls. Um, but it, 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 again, when we talk about thinking like an historian, I got a phone call, voicemail message, so I can document it, um, from a teacher. Uh, and I always cringe when my system alerts me that I have a voicemail message that is more than three minutes long. And she had taken, in, she had taken issue with two of the questions that we asked. And over the course of three minutes, as she was explaining to me the problems with both of the questions, she realized that her, her own error in reading those questions, in making her own assumptions and not truly reading what was there and understanding what was the question was asked. You know, that sort of exp you know, exploration is what we're hoping to find, uh, you know, is, is to really look at this in a way that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm fortunate in that I, I have two kids. My son is in seventh grade, which means he is taking American history this year. Um, what that meant is he spent the first three months of the year studying the American Revolution. Three, first three months of the school year. The only thing that he recalls is his teacher had told him, whenever you're in doubt, the answer is taxation. <laughs> um, and when you're helping a 12-year-old boy prepare for tests that he doesn't want, that's the one thing he does remember. And unfortunately, it was correct for half the questions. Um, that's the sort of thing we want to get beyond. I mean, it, it's one of those, I, I, it, it becomes impossible for me to figure out how do you teach young people to grow up as I had with an appreciation for it. Um, but it really becomes the issue of how do we do this in a way that makes sense? Because I think what we know is that those, the way that American history was taught, we can look at those over 65 who do it particularly well, um, and we can make some assumptions. One, those over 65 know a lot of the history that is tested because they've lived a lot of the history. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. They were, they were students during World War II. They understand what happened during the Cold War. Um, everything is part of who they are. Um, for, and they learned as part of the process when they themselves were students. They learned those names and dates and facts and figures. They learned it, it was drilled. Um, American history was about the winners, and that was how you learned it. Um, and so it became part of what, what one was brought up with. And then we saw the adaptations, and we see, you know, for those under the age of 40, most of history are things that happened way back when. 
And there are things that happen to people that don't necessarily look like them that come from their same backgrounds. Um, as I said, when you look at the breakdowns in terms of what American, Americans know and don't know, and I will say, I, we're getting ready, I've been, I've been going through the data, 41,000 people surveyed makes for a lot of disaggregated data points. Um, and people are always hungry to know very specifics in terms of well, how did this demographic group do versus that demographic group. Um, and part of that becomes a real challenge because you know, anybody who's gone through disaggregated data knows it'd be very easy to say, you know, this is how Latinos did. Um, but there's a big difference between those who have come to the country in the last 10 years, and we do capture all that, uh, you know, versus those whose families came over from Spain 50 years ago. Um, there's a big difference when you're looking at Asian Americans and you're looking at Chinese Americans versus Hmongs. All that's different. And so we don't want to make any assumptions that people are going to leap to and just sort of look at that, of course. Um, so we really want to be smart, and we're going to be releasing a lot of that data uh, later this spring so people can begin to look at that uh, and begin to draw their own conclusions. Um, but it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, Vermont does well, not just because you know, it's sort of part of the Vermont history and they, you know, they've been part of the American Revolution. It's something that's taught. Um, of most states, Vermont is probably one of the most homogeneous states in the Union. Uh, how they teach it is relevant to the majority of their people. And we can see that in a lot of the states that did well. I mean, you see that in South Dakota did particularly well, for instance. Montana did better than average. You can look at those states that did particularly poorly. Those are states that are largely in the South. Uh, those are states where you have school districts with very low incomes, very low per pupil expenditures. And in many of those states, you have high minority populations. It's not an assumption to draw, but again, it talks about the relevance of what's, of what's happening and how it's taught. So I have been rambling at all of you for quite some time now. Um, and so what questions do you all have? Yes. I guess I'm a little bit confused about the linking between the, problem, the, the data that you're looking at and the solution that you're proposing. So I'm all with you with talk about building students' historical thinking, getting students of color and immigrant students to think about history that looks more like that. I don't understand, like, it doesn't seem like those are things that are going to translate into knowing who, what Benjamin Franklin did, or who Dwight Eisenhower was. And, like, what, why is that the measure that you're using to, to assess whether students are more engaged in history or are able to do these more abstract historical things themselves? It's a very good question that we get asked a lot. Uh, and so what it comes down to, the answer is that we're, we're not looking to necessarily make that correlation. Um, we use the citizenship exam because we needed some metric that could be used to show that this is indeed a problem that needs addressing. Uh, that at the end of the day, despite what we may want to believe, the average person in this country, and, and we don't just look at citizens, we look at everybody, the average person in this country doesn't know American history. And so that's why we did the report that I had mentioned that looks at how states are teaching it, that looks at who's teaching it, so that we can demonstrate, again, if we look at it state by state, we look at program by program, the problem is not that we're not teaching American history. We are teaching it. Um, we know that you have to pass it, but that's not the issue. It really becomes this notion, again, if you look in terms of the cognitive sciences, what is it about how American history is taught that we learn it in the short term, but don't necessarily see the need to retain it for the long term? That's what we're trying to get at. Drop that. That's going away. So, 
And in America, where we just sort of like hodgepodge them together, while also having the belief that little kids can't understand history, which if you've ever taken like a kindergartner to see mummies, like they can understand history, they love history, they think it's the most fascinating thing ever. Like talking about fire trucks is, is they're, they're kind of over, but that's what schools introduce as social studies. So of course by the time they get to seventh grade, they have no foundation, they have no idea what's going on. And I mean, I've taught seventh graders, seventh graders hate everything, anything you tell them. <laughs> I think you're right. I think there are a lot of organizations now that are focusing on social studies, but they're doing so exclusively on civics. Yeah. And the difference is our, our work right now is focused exclusively on American history. Yeah. Because uh, we do think that's a need that's not being addressed. Yeah. So to, to add to what you've just said, I'm wondering, you know, if you sort of delegate most of the history teaching to this interactive experience, right, experiential learning, right, you're sort of running a risk of sort of dummifying it even further. You know what I mean? Because like I have a 10th gra grader, right, a 16 years old, and in the first 10 years we changed three states and three schools, right? And no one can develop interest in the subject as well as a passionate, well-educated, motivated teacher. And we have one now, and he's crazy. We have to talk to who's going to come here today, you know, okay, I've got the last two years, right? So I'm wondering, right, you can create the best interactive program on earth, right? But if you don't have a teacher who is passionate, very well educated with the critical thinker, right, to sort of make the connection and help <coughs> the, the, the student connect with the, with, with the history, it might just be, you know, sort of dumbifying, simplifying, and watering down the subject even further. You're absolutely right. And, and one of the, what, we, what we're trying to do is we're not looking just to plant teachers. We're looking at how can we supplement what's happening in the classroom, particularly when you see there are such gaps in how American history is taught, simply because in, in the course of nine and a half months, you can only cover so much. So how can we begin to supplement that? But you're absolutely, the, the data is clear in terms of the impact that a high quality teacher can have on a student's life. Uh, and based on our own history, we would never even dream of doing away with it. Yes. <coughs> How do we compare with other countries? Is there anything we can learn from them? It's a very good question. We don't know anything about other, other countries' history, but that's not the question you're asking. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I think as, as we have gone through this discussion, it's, uh, it's been fascinating <clears throat> when I look at our data and see the pickup that it's gotten overseas in terms of the impression of what Americans, how little Americans know about their own history. Um, I have not seen anything with regard to, uh, I don't even, I, don't even so I gotta look at that, I gotta, look, I gotta find an answer for you. I don't know the answer. It's a fascinating question.
No, I think that's right. You know, one of the things we want to do is you know, how do you provide some of that supplemental? So even if you have a teacher who doesn't get to a particular period, if the student has an interest in it, they have the opportunity to study that in some way. I work for a traditional publisher and we struggle with this all the time. Um, I pitch some ambitious ideas, but if you don't have the funding for it, if it's something outside of the box, it doesn't get done. Because we've got things that seem to work in the marketplace, but um, so that can be a struggle, but I, I hear your point. We also had animals in when, when I was growing up that helped build us rocks. So we got to that next grade for a short five to seven year window when that was popular. But yeah, I get the point of just wanting to do something outside of the box, but sometimes funding is the tricky part. Absolutely. It's a fascinating question. As I said, I mean, people have issues with the practice test that the citizenship exam provides. And one of the things you have is, which is, I, I didn't realize until I went through the process of identifying the questions, um, that depending on which state you live in, you have a different practice test. Um, and I, I ended up, as we were pulling this together, I, I, I sampled, I think, seven or eight states to pull questions. Um, and to know that how one, the, the, the language one uses to describe the Civil War, is different in Massachusetts compared to Georgia, compared to Texas, compared to California states. Uh, and, and, and this becomes the problem: is how do you how do you tell some of the more controversial periods in American history without offending people while still educated? I don't think you've quite figured out. I was raised in the South. I learned it was about states' rats, and Abraham Lincoln was a racist. You know, like. My, my college professor taught it as the war of northern aggression. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was, so I operate in a pretty international environment in science, and I really feel like I had a pretty good American history education, and I've been really interested in it for a long time. But world history, we would do like 5% if we had to do like a world citizenship questionnaire, I think. And I feel like there's a real lack of world history teaching in America across the board. I think that's true. I think for anybody who followed the controversy over the last year, the College Board was trying to address how do you teach AP world history. Right. And decided that to avoid the controversy, they would simply set it as everything from 1450 onward, hmm. um, which created a whole new set of, of controversies with it. I think how we teach history, I mean, even whether you know, when you talk about a certain period in American history, depending on who you want to talk to, it's either westward expansion or it's how the West was won. Right. Uh, and we can't agree, and, and how it's presented is going to come with its own set of challenges. So I would also agree with the person up there. Uh, I had American history last in well over 50 years ago in, in high school, and, 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 before that, and we never got anywhere near up to date. So I had, I had American history in the 60s, and we didn't get up to World War II. Um, so it's it's like hard to imagine how you can accelerate it so much that people with like 60 or 70 more years of history to learn could do any better than he did. By not fetishizing the founding fathers. Well, that's part of it. When I think about history, you know, my friends through it, I think about hearing stories from my grandmother about the depression, hearing stories from my mother about the depression.
stress to them that these citizens have to pass a test to become Americans. And they were horrified at themselves. And I thought that was great. <laughs> Why I agree with that in terms of just how do you do a distraction? How do you do that couple? It's essentially a sound bite lesson for students. Or you can do it on something that just happened now, or you can do it on something that happened 20 years ago.
Starting with high school simply because of all of the grades, that is the one that the highest percentage of students are required to take. Uh, middle school, obviously, elementary school is not, uh, not close. But our plan is to cascade it down to lower grades. That's one of the reasons we're talking with different outside of school time environments, which are focused far more on the elementary middle grades than on high school, uh, to begin to see. I mean, they've done a relatively strong job over the last decade or so on having STEM in the OSP program. Boston is one of the, one of the great models of that. And so we've begun those conversations. Again, what can we do about nursing history? Because, um, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, it's like many subjects, but history even more so. I mean, it's, it's perceived as being dry. You don't know if there's any people that have jobs in the history profession. Uh, and so you have one bad teacher in an elementary or middle school year, and you're done with history. So I think the hope is if we can do some in high school, you actually will get more people. They might not major in it, but at least study history while they enroll in college mm -hmm. uh, and begin to see the value and appreciation of it. Yeah. No, I got the hook about 10 minutes ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs>